Welcome to the 2023 Bekenstein Memorial Lecture in Fundamental Physics. Um, I'm happy to invite Nadav Katz, the head of the Raqqa Institute of Physics, to greet us. Hello, everyone, and uh, thank you uh, for coming and for joining. This uh, is uh, something which really reminds me of, uh, of Jacob's unique personality, uh, which was, uh, uh, I was looking for the right words as I was thinking uh, it over last night, and Jacob was really uh, like a bridge over troubled waters. He was always uh, calm and he always focused on the important things in life, uh, which were to him, his research, his family, and uh, doing what he loved. And uh, I had the unique pleasure of uh, transforming over the years from uh, his student as an undergrad and learning uh, general relativity uh, from him personally uh, to a colleague when I joined the Rakach Institute as faculty and ultimately, uh, and hopefully uh, as, as, a, as a friend. He uh, always uh, supported uh, <laughs> All my activities, uh, but uh, laughed at my uh, extent of volunteering and uh, setting up uh, quantum activities, but uh, happily joined and participated in uh, whenever there was a deep academic uh, interest, he always was there uh, and participated and contributed. So we have really uh, this wonderful new tradition to honor him, and it's a pleasure for the Rakach Institute to host and uh, participate in organizing this lecture. And we thank uh, the family for joining us and uh, Barak for organizing this yearly lecture and uh, for Professor Lusso for honoring us this year. Thank you. Okay, so thank you very much, Nadav. Obviously, usually we have a larger crowd, but this is un these are unusual circumstances, and we had some debate what to do, and finally we decided we're going to hold this event and uh, record it, so we would have it on record, and anyone who would be interested to listen to this lecture in some quieter times would be able to do so. Uh, my name is uh, Barack Cole, and it's a pleasure and privilege to chair the 2023 Beckenstein Memorial Lecture here at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem in the free, democratic, and united state of Israel. This year, the talk will be delivered for the first time in a hybrid format. In Rothberg Hall, we have audience from the Raqqa Institute of Physics and other departments. And in addition, we have remote viewers from throughout Israel as part of the Israel Physics Colloquium. Before I introduce our speaker for today, I would like to tell you a bit about Jacob Beckenstein, and especially to tell those who did not know him in person. So uh, dear Beckenstein family, dear participants, our distinguished colleague, Professor Jacob Beckenstein, is known throughout the world as the discoverer of black hole entropy and for several other achievements. I believe that black hole entropy would be discussed further during the talk. Beckenstein's scientific achievements were recognized by numerous awards, including the Israel Prize of 2005, the Wolf Prize of 2012, and the Einstein Prize of the American Physical Society in 2015. Sadly, he passed away unexpectedly in August 2015. To the memory of this great Israeli scientist, our institute established a yearly lecture in, the fundam in fundamental physics, and this is our seventh such lecture. Jacob Beckenstein was born in 1947 in Mexico City. His parents were Jewish immigrants from Poland who met in Mexico during the war. In his youth, his family moved to the United States, first to Texas, then to New York. He attended the Polytechnic Institute of Berk Brooklyn, where he received a master's degree in 69. Then he attended Princeton University, 
And it was there that he discovered black hole entropy in order to answer a beautiful question posed by John Wheeler, his thesis advisor. advisor. The question was, if we pour a cup of tea into a black hole, does its entropy disappear? He obtained his PhD in 1972. After a two-year postdoc at the University of Texas at Austin, he accepted a faculty position at Ben-Gurion University. Finally, in 1990, he moved here to the Hebrew University of Jerusalem. Beckenstein has written a charming and witty scientific autobiography titled Of Gravity, Black Holes, and Information. Out of it, I would like to read out to you a few, a quote in his own word, and that's a description of one of his highest moments uh, scientifically. So I was jarred when in early 1974, Hawking published his famous article in the journal Nature introducing black hole radiance. What he had done was to investigate mathematically the quantum behavior of a field in the gravitational field of a black hole, which is just forming. The surprise was that the black hole becomes luminous, slowly losing its mass to radiation. And this radiation, which includes all types of particles, has the character of radiation from a hot body. It is thermal radiation. So here was the missing radiation that was hinted at by the black hole temperature. Hawking calculated the black hole temperature of the same form I had written down two years earlier. Things fitted together. Suddenly, black hole thermodynamics stopped being laughed at and becoming accepted. I was amazed that the change in attitude was so rapid because he introduced this idea two years earlier and it was ignored and laughed at. Of course, I believed in my ideas, but after a long ridicule, I expected that they would gain recognition only gradually. I'm reminded of Schopenhauer's dictum. All truth passes through three stages. First, it is ridiculed. Second, it is violently opposed. Thirdly, it is accepted as well as self-evident. Okay, so this was indeed a glorious moment, and this is the description that you can find in the book. Now, uh, let me turn to introduce our speaker, Rafael Busso from the University of California, Berkeley. Busso is a leader in cosmology, general relativity, and high energy physics. He was born in Haifa, grew up in Germany, and did his PhD in Cambridge, United Kingdom, advised by Stephen Hawking. He has postdoctoral position, he had postdoctoral positions at Stanford, UC Santa Barbara and Harvard, and since 2003, he has been faculty at Berkeley. In 1999, Busso introduced the so-called covariant entropy bound or Busso entropy bound. Work by Beckenstein, Susskind, and others showed that the area of a surface in, is in natural units bounds the entropy within it. However, would it hold in a time-dependent and curved background? And if so, what should be the definition of within? Busso showed that the entropy should be bounded on a natural geometric object, the contracting light sheet or the causal diamond. By now, the original work in the Associated Review have collected together almost 3,000 citations. In, 2000, in the year 2000, together with Polchinski, he discussed a dynamic mechanism to explain why the cosmological constant is so small in natural Planck units, a problem known as the cosmological constant problem. They did so within a certain model in string theory, which was shown to display a very large number of possible vacua, the so-called discretum, okay? a discrete continuum, discretum. In this sense, this was a precursor for the notion of the string theory landscape, which has become rather popular later. Busso is a talented communicator of science and you can find on YouTube several of his presentations and appearances on YouTube channels. Look for them after his talk, not now. Raphael had a personal connection with Jacob Beckenstein who offered him a postdoc position here at the Hebrew University. And moreover, his work is perhaps the closest continuation to Jacob. I can also mention that I overlapped with Raphael at Stanford during the academic year 1997-98, and it was wonderful. 
Please join me with a warm welcome to Rafael Bussi. Can you hear me okay? Right. Um, it's a great honor to be here and celebrate Jacob Beckenstein. Um, he's one of my true heroes and uh, also a beloved mentor. Um, and when I spoke with Barack yesterday after landing at the airport, um, my feeling was, as I'd expressed it to him, that I really wanted this talk to be just about Jacob um, and to sort of separate that from all the events going on in Israel right now. Um, for those of you watching this recording much later, it's a time of great turmoil. Um, anyway, after that, the defense minister uh, was fired and so on. And it became pretty clear that that strategy wasn't going to work. So let me say a few words uh, in part to explain why I'm not wearing the suit I brought along. Um, Barack mentioned that I was born in Israel. He also mentioned that I did not actually live here. I can't claim a connection to the country as strong as, as, as uh, what you have. I spent my summer childhoods here. My father's family immigrated from Egypt in the 50s. Um, so at least I would say I care. Um, just as a human, I feel freedom is important. Democracy is important. Um, and uh, as a scientist, I think the difference between truth and falsehood is important. Something that we've been struggling with in the United States as well on occasion. Um, and so in that context, I was, you know, honored to be with my old friend Barack a few hours ago, uh, near the Knesset and seeing so many people stand up for those values. Uh, and I'll leave it at that. Uh, now onward to, uh, Jacob Beckenstein. Uh, I, I think as a scientist, you also need a little bit of fun. <laughs> this again okay um you know it's hard it's hard to know what will happen to your work generations later whether it will still be regarded as important um i can't think of anyone whose stocks you should have bought more than those of jacob beckenstein his work is still undergoing dramatic evolution. His insight that black holes have an entropy, that, that the area of surfaces is a statistical quantity, is still the single most important insight that we've gained uh, about quantum gravity, about unifying the two pillars of theoretical physics, quantum mechanics and Einstein's general relativity. And not only that, but you'll see a lot of pictures of young people on these slides. That's because these developments are still going on, and in fact, have become particularly dramatic and, and rapid in recent years. So this talk kind of wrote itself. But I, I think we should start more or less chronologically uh, to put Jacob into some context. Uh, this is Karl Schwarzschild. Uh, he found the first black hole solution of Einstein's general relativity. Um, during the time of the First World War. So it is possible to do science during tumultuous times. Uh, I don't think black holes were very well understood until uh, Jacob Oppenheimer, uh, with a student at Berkeley, um, published a very influential paper in which, in which they already understood a sort of dual character of black holes. That if you're sitting on the surface of a star that's collapsing to form a black hole, there's nothing special you would notice when you cross the event horizon, but that from far away, there's sort of like a thing that, that you can probe with properties. It has a mass, it has maybe a charge, angular momentum, 
you can see what happens if you send a wire through it, some charge through it. Um, they, they already described this, this property very well. Well, that was a misfire. Let me use this for the pointer. I don't know why this guy photobombed here, but um, then uh, in, in the 1960s, it became clear that black holes really do form. That was quite unclear for a while. It was a subject of debate, um, but uh, in, a, in a series of important theorems and results, uh, Roger Penrose, and then later joined by Stephen Hawking, um, gave arguments that black holes really exist and generically form and gravitational collapse. So at that point, it became likely that they'd really be out there. Of course, by now that's uh, been substantiated by a lot of observations, including the dramatic observation of the merger of black holes and the gravitational waves that they emit. So that's the minimal setting I just wanted to provide uh, to the, you know, the stage on which uh, Jacob entered in the early 70s. Um, and Barack already already uh, remind us of, reminded us of the question that he tried to answer as a graduate student. Suppose that matter falls into a black hole, what happens to its entropy? So entropy is, is a measure of disorder. It tells you how many different quantum states this matter might be in given what very little you actually know about it. Um, and, and the second law of thermodynamics tells you that uh, in physical processes, the entropy is extremely unlikely to decrease. Uh, but it looks like you can just dump entropy into a black hole. In fact, you can make this question a little bit more sophisticated. This was really a, yeah, a graduate student problem given, given to Jacob by his advisor, Wheeler. Um, you could also, for example, lower a system towards a black hole horizon. The system is warm. You could let it cool down there, radiate its heat into the black hole, and pull it back up it would weigh less when you pull it back up. Its mass would have gone down. And so you could generate work from heat uh, by this kind of process. And I've talked to other graduate students that were around at the time, like Bob Wald. And Bob's statement about this is he was so glad he didn't get this problem because it seemed kind of qualitative, a bit vague. What would you do with it? Well, Jacob, J Jacob didn't give the naive answer. See, what, what naively you would say is, I can draw you a nice space-time diagram. Here's the cup of tea with the entropy. And you know, at a later time, it's just inside the black hole. That's where the entropy is. Too bad. Maybe you don't like that it's inside the black hole. But what's the big deal? Why is this a problem? Well. Turns out that if you wait a little while after you throw in the T, then you could not verify that the entropy is still there, even if you jumped in after the, after the cup of tea, if you also jumped into the black hole. Uh, because of the way the solutions of general relativity work, you'd first end up at the singularity and you'd never see the cup of tea nor be able to receive a signal from it. So there are maybe some reasons to be a, be a little bit more nervous about this. In any case, um, I think Jacob took the, took, took the point of view that our laws of physics have to have operational meaning. If the generalized second law only has meaning so long as black holes aren't involved, then what good is it? We should stick to our guns. If you have something you think is a fundamental law, you should believe in it and see what the consequences are. And that's, I think, the viewpoint that he took. And of course, you already all know the answer, but it was far from obvious at the time. Um, he decided that, at least viewed from the outside, a black hole itself has to be assigned an entropy. How much entropy? Well, he had to guess. We always have to guess when we try to discover something new, a new law of physics. Uh, and his guess was informed by the fact that Stephen Hawking had in the previous year proven an area theorem for black holes. He had proven that the area of the event horizon in classical general relativity cannot decrease. That was a weird kind of result to prove because there aren't a whole lot of things other than entropy that don't ever decrease in physics. Uh, and so that 
made the area a good candidate for the thing that would be the stand-in for the entropy. And then basically dimensional analysis tells you that uh, you, know, you have to measure the area in, in the only units of area that you can construct out of the fundamental constants of nature called the Planck area. Uh, I've, I've, uh, I've put the Boltzmann constant and the speed of light in blue here because I plan to never write them again. Uh, but I will try to keep track of Newton's constant G and Planck's constant H bar in what follows. Okay, so that was his, his great insight, but of course he didn't stop there. Um, first of all, he clarified that we have to think of entropy as really a generalized thing now that includes the entropy of black holes. So he called it the generalized entropy. So if you're an observer and you're looking around and here is a teapot and here's a black hole and here's a bunch of other things, you're supposed to add the area of the black hole and the ordinary entropy of all the other things. Uh, and, and that's what really represents the total entropy in the universe, which he called the generalized entropy uh, to distinguish it from the ordinary entropy of matter systems. Uh, of course, today we've we've so much in you know gotten used to this concept. We should really be calling this the entropy. I mean, black holes have entropy like everything else. That's what he taught us. I, I don't know if any of you are going to push me on technical details here, but I think it's uh, it's worth having this slide just to be safe. Uh, I won't go uh, through it in in a whole lot of detail, but um, one thing that's important to note is that the sum. These, these two terms added together is actually better defined than each term separately. Each term separately uh, depends on a renormalization scale, but the sum does not. So maybe this should have been a hint all along that, that uh, they belong together. But it's a revolutionary thing to do, right? To add these two things together. One of them is geometry and the other is quantum information. And, and, and you just put a plus sign between them, basically telling us those are ultimately the same thing or they must have the same underlying origin. All right, he still wasn't done. So, you know, black holes have entropy that prevents this kind of problem that, that you can just destroy entropy by, by throwing things into them, but you have to formulate that as a statement. So the statement is the generalized entropy is the thing that cannot decrease. The ordinary entropy can decrease. You can destroy it by throwing it into a black hole. In fact, we later learned that the area of a black hole horizon can also decrease. When, when a black hole evaporates, it will decrease. But the sum of those two things together will never decrease. That's the statement of the generalized second law of thermodynamics. By the way, if you have sort of quick clarification questions, uh, those of you in the live audience, please, please interrupt. Uh, any uh, you know, other audience members, I think we said we're going to wait until the end uh, to, to take Zoom questions. Um, okay, so this, this uh, generalized second law is actually extremely revolutionary, and, and Bekenstein recognized this right away. Okay. The reason that it's so revolutionary is that it means that a classical theory, classical general relativity, somehow knows something about its own quantum states and those of all kinds of matter, which is insane, not only because the theory is classical, but because it seems inconsistent with the fact that we don't even know what the fundamental structure of matter is at the very shortest distance scales. We have no idea. And certainly it's not something that you can see, somehow see written in general relativity as part of the input. How does general relativity, a classical theory, know about how many quantum states a black hole have? So that's one question. Um, if, if you can write down a formula for the entropy of a black hole, that's, we, we couldn't do anything analogous, for example, for classical electromagnetism. You couldn't do anything like write down the entropy of a, of a crystal if you don't know what the atoms or molecules are out of which it is made and in, which, in how many ways they can wiggle. You need to have either microscopic information about the system or you need to measure experimentally how it responds when you heat it up, how much energy do you need to increase the, temp the temperature by one degree or something like that. None of that is known about a black hole. We haven't tried to heat one up and we certainly haven't 
still no idea what, what the fundamental quantum states are in general for black holes. And yet the classical theory allows us to write down a formula for how many there are. So that's amazing. The other thing that's amazing is, well, if you really believe in the generalized second law, it tells you that when you add that cup of tea to the black hole, the area goes up by enough to compensate for the lost entropy. How does the black hole know how to do that? Again, it would seem to have to know about the microscopic constituents of matter that are the things that determine how much entropy it has. And yet when you try it, it seems to work. So I wanna emphasize that all of this was already spelled out in some things in less detail, some things in more in his early work on this subject. But in 1981, he tried to make one of the aspects that I emphasized here more precise. Okay, the aspect being, um, well, how does the black hole know to increase its area by enough when I dump a certain amount of entropy in it so that the increase in area makes up for the lost entropy? So, you know, he, he did the thing that a good physicist does. He tried to break his own idea. He used a thought experiment for how to add entropy to a black hole, which made it most likely for the generalized second law to actually be violated. What are you trying to do to violate the generalized second law if you wanna play devil's advocate? You're going to try to add the cup of tea or whatever it is that you're adding to the black hole, box filled with, with, with a hot gas, whatever your favorite source of entropy is. You're going to try to add it uh, while trying to minimize the increase in the area that that process causes. Now the increase in the area of a black hole has to do roughly with how much mass you've added to the black hole. So what you're trying to do is add as little mass or energy to the black hole as possible. And the way you do that is that you lower the thing in very slowly. You first extract a lot of work by lowering it into a gravitational well, gravitational field of the black hole. And you let it fall in only at the last possible moment when you can't avoid that anymore. So if you're very optimistic about the structure of your materials being pretty rigid, then that very last moment is when one edge of your system touches the horizon of the black hole. At that point, it would be inconsistent for it to stay stable if you lowered it any further. So at that point, you just let it go. So that was the thought experiment he did. And it's not difficult to show that it leads to a bound of this form. Okay, so basically he said, Let's try to violate the generalized second law. Let's try to find a way to make the area increase as small as possible so that it's less than the, area, uh, the entropy we lose. And then assume that the GSL is not even violated in this highly adversarial process. What does the GSL imply about the entropy of this matter system? And this is what it implies. It's not surprising that the energy or mass of the matter system appears in this formula. Uh, what's not maybe so obvious is why uh, the radius, roughly the, the linear dimension of the matter system appears in the formula, but that has to do with the fact that you can only get it, so you know, you have to stop lowering it and let it drop in when one edge of the system touches the horizon. And so roughly speaking, the center of mass of the system is like a radius away from the horizon, and that's why the radius enters in this formula. What I really want to emphasize about this formula, though, is that neither Newton's constant, the signal of gravity, um, nor the black hole, any you know, properties of it are left in this formula. After you've done this thought experiment, they kind of drop out of the calculation. So this is indeed a statement just about quantum matter, seemingly divorced from gravity. So this is an example of the point that I'll just hammer home. I, I'll try to at least over and over in this talk that gravity knows something about quantum mechanics. Now, this was not immediately an interpretation that everybody embraced. In fact, the Begenstein bound ignited a huge debate, which was probably a good thing. I mean, it, it, it was sort of buried in his early work and he made it very explicit in this, in this uh, 1981 paper. Uh, and you know, it got people to start thinking about what's really a very important and fundamental issue. And this debate touched on, it was largely between, uh, between Beckenstein on one side and Unruh and Wald on the other. So of course there were many other people involved in various collaborations. 
Uh, but it involved a bunch of different questions. Not all of them were actually all that controversial. I think everybody pretty much agreed that the GSL is probably true. It seemed like a beautiful result. It fit in with a whole of black hole thermodynamics. And when you did examples, it always worked out. And also it was a pretty sharply formulated statement. It wasn't, and I'll come back to that, completely clear exactly what the definition of all the quantities in the GSL were, but, but that didn't present a huge problem. It was, it was well enough defined. What was highly controversial is whether the bound that Bekenstein claimed to have derived from the GSL really follows from it or not. Or put differently, is the Bekenstein bound actually necessary for the GSL to hold? Another question which was quite debated is whether the Bekenstein bound is true. Right. Now, going, you know, just take another look at this bound here. The entropy, you know, if we think of it as a von Neumann entropy or something like that, is it's manifestly a non-negative quantity. You could worry, for example, about Casimir energy. You know, you put some quantum field in a box with the right boundary conditions, it has negative energy. You know, all other quantities on the right-hand side being positive, that immediately would lead to a contradiction. Well, Jacob said, but you have to include the, the box in that case. You can't just, you know, look at the, at the quantum field inside the box. You have to include the walls of the box and they will have positive energy and everything will be fine. And that's true. But I think it's fair to say that it's not a satisfactory resolution of this problem. In particular, it's still not clear where exactly do you stop. Do you have to put the box in a box or what's holding it there? And also, once you include the walls of the box, the bound sort of becomes trivially satisfied. They tend to you know, contribute an enormous amount of energy. So this was not a great situation. And it was fair for people to worry about what all these quantities really mean. Unfortunately, people weren't worried about that enough. It seemed like you know, there was a lot of... Uh, a lot of papers were written, let's put it that way, on these two points here, number two and three, uh, while not paying enough attention to the fact that none of these quantities had been particularly well-defined. And that turned out in hindsight, the reason for this whole controversy. I think that happens a lot in physics. When people argue forever about something, it's often because that something, while it's sort of tantalizingly interesting, involves, involves concepts that have not been made sharp enough. And, and then you can, you know, otherwise in science, things that tend to be pretty clean. Um, and, you know, I, I'll, I'll, I'll say to my credit that I did spend considerable time on this problem uh, around, I don't know, 2002 or so, trying to make these quantities well-defined. Unfortunately, not to my credit, I totally failed. Uh, and all of my papers about this are completely worthless. Um, and I, I, I'm, I'm in, in, some, in some company, but anyway, uh, there, were no, there were no good ideas. Um, until this guy came along, Horacio Cassini, um, who kind of came out of, I mean, I, 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 I had not followed his work very closely. Uh, he was somebody with maybe a bit of a non-standard background, which sometimes serves you well when you, you can bring a new idea to a field. And in his case, he, was, he started bringing ideas from algebraic quantum field theory uh, to, this, to this problem. Algebraic quantum field theory, from my point of view, was something that a bunch of weird Germans had worked on in the 60s and that I was never going to learn uh, because I had no idea why you would possibly be interested in it. It seemed just like a bunch of very complicated formalism for no purpose that I could discern. Well, boy, was I wrong. And now I actually know something about it. I, don't, don't know as much as Horacio, but it, it's turned out that this is something I need to know. So I have to learn it. What can I do? Um, the first thing that Horacio did was to decide to think about this problem rigorously, to not be afraid to think about entropy directly in quantum field theory. So what do I mean by that? Um, you know, when we give undergraduates a quantum mechanics course, you know, we consider systems like a harmonic oscillator or something, right? And you know, maybe, maybe more complicated quantum systems, but usually systems with, with some sort of um, discrete structure, um, Hilbert space that's not too complicated. Um, and and um, certainly when we consider multiple quantum systems, they're sort of tensor factored, they're, they're separable from each other. Um, 
And, and then we can define things like a von Neumann entropy, you know, minus trace row log row for some density operator row that we define for the system. Now, the way nature works, the way fields that fill space and time actually work is not like that. Nature is described by quantum field theory, at least to an excellent approximation. I haven't seen a, a violation of it. Um, and in quantum field theory, you can't just put, you know, a surface around a region of space and say, oh, well, the entropy in here is, you know, 15.6. Um, because in quantum field theory, there are sort of fields that are entangled across the boundary of any region, which contribute an infinite amount of entropy formally. It's, it's some quantity that goes like area over your cutoff squared. And so for this reason, I guess, people have generally shied away from treating the entropy in the Bekenstein bound properly which means in the, con in the context of quantum field theory. Well, Horacio was not afraid of doing that. He figured out that, first of all, what you want to talk about is a vacuum subtracted entropy. These divergences that I just mentioned are basically universal. They have to do with the short distance behavior of the state, which is the same in the ground state or the vacuum as it is in any excited state with a bucket of water or something sitting in my region. And so if I first compute the von Neumann entropy uh, on some regulated version of the theory uh, for the excited state. And then I compute it again for the ground state and I subtract those two results, those divergences are gonna cancel. And he made a more rigorous argument for that than what I can do in this, in this uh, short review. Um, one downside of this fact, you might think, is this is vacuum subtracted entropy is not necessarily positive. Right, it's a, it's a difference between two manifestly positive quantities, two von Neumann entropies. But in fact, that's just what we needed for something like the Casimir energy to work out. It's actually good if the S on the left-hand side of Beckett-Sein's bound isn't necessarily positive. Well, what did, what did uh, Horacio do with this? Um, he first of all reformulated the Beckett-Sein bound as this statement, delta S is less than delta K. So here delta S is, the vacuum subtracted entropy that I just uh, described. Delta K is uh, something that some of you may have heard of called the Rindler energy. Um, if you don't know what that is, Delta K is morally the same thing as the right-hand side of Bekenstein's bound. The main difference being that it's always well-defined. For example, for a hydrogen atom in the ground state, what would be exactly the radius? I mean, you might want to say it's the Bohr radius, but you know, the wave function has a tail that goes out to infinity. You can't make sense of exactly what the radius is supposed to be that you're gonna put in this right-hand side of Bekenstein's bound uh, for that particular object, right? Um, this delta K is something that's always well-defined in quantum field theory. And in some cases it reduces to this formula, like when you have a very well localized object sitting at a certain distance from this, uh, from this Rindler horizon. Um, so, so the, the great advantage of delta K is it's always well-defined and it sometimes reduces to the thing that, that Jacob wrote down. Okay. Uh, okay. I, again, in, in my, my lawyers make me put this in, in case anybody asks questions, but I'll skip right over it. Um, last step. It's not, you know, he didn't just stop with reformulating the Bekenstein bound. Uh, in terms of quantities which are sharply defined, that would have been great enough. There would have already been a lot of progress. Now you have a, a conjecture where at least you know what everything means in it. But he didn't stop there, he also proved it. In fact, the proof goes in one line. Uh, there's something called a relative entropy between two states, rho and sigma. In this case, rho again is our excited state and sigma is, is the vacuum reduced to, to this uh, uh, Rindler region. Um, the relative entropy is defined by this particular formula. It's not important what this formula is. What's important is that like in finite dimensional quantum, uh, quantum systems, it can be shown in algebraic quantum field theory that this quantity is never negative. And when you, write, when you expand this formula out, you find that this right-hand side here is precisely the difference between delta K and delta S. So the positivity of the relative entropy is literally identical to the statement of the Bekenstein model. So this is quite interesting because now you've used some kind, kind of non-trivial properties of quantum field theory to prove something that Jacob first got from gravity. 
So I think the evidence is sort of building up that gravity really, you know, le it leads us to insights about nature that naively belong completely outside of the domain of gravity to non-gravitational physics. Now, I think that still people were not completely convinced that this is the right way of thinking about it. I remember having discussions about this with others, and there was definitely a glass half empty camp, uh, which would say, well, you know, it's nice that we finally have a correct statement about quantum field theory that Cassini formulated for us, uh, but I still don't believe it has anything to do with gravity. Uh, the glass half full camp to which I belonged was uh, like, oh, wow, you know, this really shows gravity knew it all along. And now it's, it's, been, it's been proven. The reason that we couldn't quite resolve this issue is that th the thought experiment that you have to use, and this is not, this is not Jacob's fault, if you try to get from, from lowering a system into a black hole uh, to, to this kind of bound, there are a lot of subtleties and a lot of assumptions you have to make that could go wrong and that make this connection heuristic rather than rigorous. Okay, so it was still a bit of an open question. Uh, but I'll describe some other developments since then that I think have completely nailed the interpretation that gravity knows about the quantum states of matter. Okay, and the first of these uh, is something I just want to come back to the generalized second law. Um, I mentioned earlier that the generalized second law was also, well, it was never really controversial, but it wasn't totally clear how it should be understood. And there were lots of, so, so this graduate student here, uh, Aaron Wall, when he was a graduate student, now he's a professor at Cambridge, um, as part of his graduate work, decided to write a review paper about I don't remember how many he found, but basically 10 different interpretations that people had given to the generalized second law. On the one hand, it showed that people took great interest in it. On the other hand, it showed that there clearly was some confusion in the community about exactly how it should be understood and what the precise mathematical statement should be. Well, that exercise served Aaron very well, because first of all, after analyzing all these different proposed interpretations, uh, he decided that the correct one, and I think that is still uh, the way that the community now understands the general sec second law, is that uh, it applies to all causal horizons. That includes the event horizon of a black hole as a special case, but it's uh, quite a bit more general. A causal horizon is the boundary of the past of any, of any world line, of any time-like or light-like observer, if you will. Okay, and you can apply to any of those null surfaces, not just the event horizons of a black hole, uh, but not, for example, to other horizons like the apparent horizon of a black hole and so on. Um, good. So, so that was his first, I think, important piece of progress. He knew exactly what the law actually was supposed to be. And then a few years later, he was able to prove it perturbatively. So that means I need to have a large black hole into, into which I, th I throw a not very heavy matter system. But still, in that setting, he, he proved it completely generally, once again, using techniques from algebraic quantum field theory. He needed something stronger than what Cassini used, uh, but it turns out the relative entropy that I said earlier was always positive, also obeys a property called monotonicity. It basically means that if I look at the quantum state on the black hole horizon, uh, starting at a particular time on the horizon, and then I, and I try to distinguish you know, a, a state with some matter in it from the vacuum, that becomes harder and harder uh, the later I look. If I, if I have access only to a later portion of the, of the event horizon of a black hole, that's the statement of the mon uh, monotonicity of the relative entropy. And it just so happens that if you, you know, think about it long enough and, and, and do the math, it implies the generalized second law of thermodynamics. Okay. And I think that was a, another, uh, brick in the wall, if you will, it, 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 it emphasized um, the connection to Cassini's proof, the fact that it's the same object in algebraic quantum field theory, the relative entropy that's involved, and basically tells you that the Bekenstein bound can be viewed as an integral of the generalized second law. Since both things are inequalities, uh, maybe I shouldn't 
shouldn't have written an equal sign here. You can integrate an inequality, but you can't differentiate it, right? Uh, you can add inequalities, it'll still be an inequality, but if you subtract two inequalities, then you're not guaranteed to get any inequality. Um, and so, so the GSL, of course, here is the stronger statement from which the Bekenstein bound follows by integration. There's something else that I thought was very beautiful that, that uh, Aaron Wall did uh, not long afterwards, or maybe around the same time, which goes back to, you know, I showed you a picture of, of Penrose uh, at the very beginning. He did this foundational work on black holes. Uh, and, and a key element in that work was the famous singularity theorem that he proved in 1965. Um, that, that you know, inside a black hole, there has to be some kind of singularity, some, some place where, where uh, general relativity just breaks down. Um, this theorem that he proved, and for which he later got a Nobel Prize, so this is not a small theorem, uh, relied on something called the null energy condition, which is basically the statement that the energy density of matter looks, looks non-negative to a light ray. That's fine for classical matter, but it's known to be false in quantum field theory. It's false in the standard model. It's just wrong in the real world. The assumption on which Penrose had based his theorem was just not true. What Aaron was able to do was throw away that assumption and replace it with the generalized second law of thermodynamics. Now you could say, okay, we don't know for sure that the generalized second law is true, but hey, at least we don't know for sure that it's wrong, which is what was the case for the, for the assumption that, that Penrose used. It, it put the theorem in play again. And the theorem is one that has huge you know, significance. We need to know quantum gravity inside a black hole. There's, there's places where that actually matters. So that was a very beautiful argument. And it, it started, I think, the, a viewpoint which is now quite prevalent of thinking of the generalized second law um, as, as one of the more fundamental principles of physics that we have that we can really use as a tool to derive results. Now I'm going to have to go back a little bit in time because I want to talk about holographic entropy balance, which is another thread and hopefully we'll, we'll tie those threads together in a moment. Can you remind me when I started actually? Um, 40, wow, okay, good, I better hurry up. Um, yeah, so also based on very similar logic to the logic that, that uh, Beckenstein had applied when, when uh, arguing for his bound, one that involves radius times energy and only H bar on the, on the right-hand side, you can also get to this so-called holographic entropy bound that says that the entropy uh, in a region of space has to be less than the surface area surrounding that region. Again, in these Planck units, roughly the idea is, well, you could convert this whole region into a black hole of that surface area. And the generalized second law tells you that the entropy can't go down when that happens, or the generalized entropy can't go down. And so this follows. Okay. Um, but in fact, the argument for this is much weaker than, than uh, the argument that Bekenstein had for deriving his bound. And it's much easier to find huge violations of this bound. Uh, if, you, if you take it to literally mean that you pick a spatial region and you know, the entropy is supposed to be less than the area surrounding it, it's just not true in cosmology. In the universe we live in, it's also not even true in this room because I can surround this room uh, with, with a surface of arbitrarily small area. That's what you know, sick relativists teach you how to do. Um, and, and so it's, it's just as a mathematical statement, it's completely false. <laughs> um, and, and actually, Fischler and Saskin noticed this early on and tried to fix it up, uh, but their proposal didn't quite work either. And so that was sort of um, my early contribution to this subject to formulate a version of this bound that actually works. It wasn't clear, of course, that there exists such a version. But it turns out that, yes, that you can make a guess and it seems to work. Uh, what you're supposed to do is start with the surface of area A and then look at what's called its light sheets, certain null surfaces attached to it, regions explored by light rays, that are not expanding. Uh, and then it'll be true that the entropy on those light sheets is less than the area. Uh, so you can think of this bound as a generalization of the generalized second law. When you, when you look, when you pick the surface to lie on the horizon of a black hole, then 
it reduces to the generalized second law, but you can talk about other uh, surfaces as well. And let me just uh, give you, I, I don't wanna go through the history of this. I'll give you a modern perspective of how we think about this bound now from the perspective of a paper I wrote with um, my collaborators in 2015. The point is that we can define Bekenstein's generalized entropy not just for surfaces that happen to lie on the horizon of a black hole. You can take any surface that divides space into one side and another and take its area and add to it the von Neumann entropy of the quantum fields reduced to that other side, let's say. Um, and that defines a generalized entropy. And then you can ask, just as Begenstein made a statement about how the generalized entropy changes along a black hole horizon, we can ask more generally, how does this generalized entropy change if I follow some light rays away from my original surface? Our guess about how it should change was based on just generalizing a classical statement about general relativity. Matter focuses light. This famous deflection of light by the sun experiment that Eddington did is an example of that, that so dramatically confirmed Einstein's general relativity. But again, this is actually only true for matter with positive energy and not all matter has positive energy. Now, what we can do is regard this classical expansion as, as the, you know, the change in area uh, of, of a surface that I deform along those light rays. And with that viewpoint, it's easy to replace the classical expansion with a quantum corrected quantity. You replace the area by the generalized entropy and you conjecture, let me skip over the details, uh, you conjecture that this generalized entropy expansion, the quantum expansion, is, is never positive. That this is called the quantum focusing conjecture. It's again, it's a conjecture. We don't know it's true, but at least unlike the classical focusing statement, at least it's not definitely wrong. And it seems to work. Okay. In fact, it's quite powerful. It implies, of course, the classical focusing theorem in the classical limit. It implies the generalized second law and then in the classical limit Hawking's area theorem. It, in, it implies the 1999 version of my entropy bound. Uh, also a generalized second law for cosmology uh, that, that Meta Engelhardt and I uh, discovered that I won't have time to talk about. What I will talk about for one minute is the so-called quantum null energy condition. This is again, the sort of non-gravitational implication. That's what I've been emphasizing mainly in this talk that you can learn something about non-gravitational physics from conjectures about gravity or semi-classical gravity. The quantum null energy condition is the non-gravitational limit of this, of this uh, quantum focusing conjecture that I just had written down. You basically look at how light waves behave when you send them in a weakly gravitating region off of a flat plane. And they get sort of focused or not by the, by the matter. You evaluate the statement of, of the quantum focusing conjecture in that setting, and you find a, an amazing result. At least I was quite surprised by it. You find that a you can get a lower bound on the local stress tensor of matter, on the local energy density as seen by light rays, in terms of an information theoretic quantity, the rate, really the second derivative, at which the entropy of one side of a surface changes if I deform it along that light ray. This is called the quantum null energy condition. And it's the first lower bound on the uh, energy density of matter that, that uh, was found. Okay. And it was found in two lines, uh, these two lines, it's not important exactly what they are. But my point is, once you believe this conjecture about quantum gravity, the quantum focusing conjecture, you can get this bound essentially for free. It wasn't known before. And uh, when you try to prove it, in quantum field theory, which you can because it only has H bar in it. It only has Planck's constant, no longer Newton's constant. Well, we had 20 pages like this just for the free field theory case. So I think now the case is really starting to build up that gravity knows something about quantum mechanics and quantum field theory that is in fact easier to understand in gravity than in quantum field theory. Later, it was proven for interacting fields as well. This took a while. It was really hard to prove this in quantum field theory. The general proof is by Faulkner and it's like 70 pages. And he uses things like 
modular flow, like really advanced techniques from algebraic quantum field theory. So that's my summary. I have, I have like two or three more slides on, on current developments, but uh, hopefully. Um, so in the realm of semi-classical gravity, this is how I would view the logical flow now. The GSL has been developed into stronger and stronger statements from which it follows. And this is, you know, this is the hallmark of a, of a true breakthrough discovery when there's more and more structure, richer and richer insights, more and more generality to it as you explore it. That's, that's what happened to Jacob's discovery. The quantum focusing conjecture is now sort of the, 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 the mother statement here. It's the one from which we can derive all the others. Um, and, and in particular, there's this whole other sequence down here which are basically the quantum field theory or weak gravity limits where Newton's constant just disappears. And we seem to be making a statement about a part of physics that has nothing to do with gravity. The quantum null energy condition was the first lower bound on the energy density of matter that was discovered. The monotonicity of the relative entropy was known by a few obscure algebraic quantum field theorists, but it wasn't recognized as a statement of the generalized second law until much more recently. And similarly, the positivity of the relative entropy hadn't been recognized um, as, as just really a sharp statement of Bekenstein's found until the work of Cassini. Uh, so this rich structure has filled out, and there are actually quite a few places on this slide that I could be filling in uh, on the, the white space here that I just don't have time to tell you about. What I do want to tell you about is that We've now entered an era where the gravitational path integral is really proving itself to be almost ridiculously powerful. Much, much, when I was a grad student, the gravitational path integral was considered to be a really weird, vague thing that was probably completely ill-defined and tells you, you know, it's good for almost nothing. Well, four years ago, my now colleague Jeff Pennington and a collaboration that includes these wonderful people here, Ahmed Almeri, Neta Engelhardt, uh, Henry Maxfield, um, we're able to derive what's called the page curve for the Hawking radiation of a black hole. The page curve is the graph that you would draw when you plot the von Neumann entropy of the Hawking radiation as a function of time or as a function for of how many Hawking quanta have been emitted. Now, there was, of course, this huge debate, which I never even mentioned so far, about the black hole information paradox, right? Hawking said information is lost. Almost everybody else said, no, that can't be true. Black holes have to return the information, even though we don't know how. Um, well, if they do return the information, then the Hawking radiation entropy has to follow this page curve. It has to go up and then back down to zero, because that's what happens when you gain access to the quantum state of a system that's in a pure state, as long as it's a, a typical pure state. Okay. Well. These folks were able to derive that just from gravity. There were, of course, indirect arguments for unitarity for information not being lost. Before that, coming from string theory, from ADS CFT, and so on, all of those required you to, you know, buy into. I, I mean, I think very plausible conjectures like ADS CFT, but it wasn't. It wasn't something that we'd ever hoped to see come out of just a gravity calculation, because famously, that's the kind of calculation that Hawking did and found that information is lost. How did these guys find something else? Well, they figured a, out a way of asking gravity directly what the entropy of the Hawking radiation is, rather than first trying to compute the state of the radiation and then the entropy from that. The state of the radiation is a very complicated thing. The entropy is a little simpler. And so somehow they managed to get that out of gravity apparently correctly. Here's another recent development. Gravity ensemble duality, there's increasing evidence, first in papers by Phil Saad and his collaborators, Schenker and Stanford, and then later in papers that I wrote with Maria Tomasevich and my student Liz Wildenheim, um, that the gravitational path integral is in a very precise sense dual to an ensemble of quantum mechanical theories. So it's actually not one quantum mechanical theory. One such ensemble is actually known, it's called the SYK model, and it's dual, at least approximately dual to some, to some uh, model of 
gravity in one plus one dimension. But there's a lot of evidence that this is more generally true in that we get answers we want by asking the questions in the right way. So for example, um, in any unitary theory for the formation and evaporation of a black hole, the, in, in any such theory, the entropy will follow the page curve. Therefore, if you compute an ensemble average, you'll still get the page curve. However, if you compute an ensemble average of the quantum states that are spit out by these unitary theories, those states will generically be different for each unitary theory. They'll all be pure, but they'll be different. So if you average over them, you'll get a mixed state. You'll get Hawking's result. So we can now understand some of these apparent contradictions within these calculations. Why were these people getting the page curve from gravity and Hawking was getting information loss from gravity? That would start making sense if the gravitational path integral is really dual to an ensemble of theories. And then finally, in a development that really blew my mind, I don't know how many of you were around in the 1990s when string theory was hailed for first allowing you to compute the exact number, integer number of quantum states of a supersymmetric black hole. In a supersymmetric black hole, the ground state can be highly degenerate and, and string theory was able to, you know, so you don't just get e to the a over four as some sort of approximate statement, but you can literally count all the states. Well, that integer has been reproduced without the help of string theory by uh, Eliezu and Toriachi and their collaborators. And it's really a tour de force. You use the gravitational path integral to compute a partition function and you have all these terms, none of which look like integers. A huge sum, infinite sum over infinitely many terms. And you, you stare at it and you see that it's something called the Rademacher expansion, which comes out of number theory and which sort of was invented to go in the opposite direction. You start with an integer and you expand it in some, in some funny way. So here, these, these non-integer terms all reassemble themselves into a nice integer. So hopefully I've convinced you that gravity is, is very powerful and it knows about its own quantum states and about those of matter. You can derive statements about non-gravitational physics from gravity. What that really means is that there is no such thing as non-gravitational physics. It's already built in, and we learned that from, from Jacob. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much, Rafael, for this uh, wide, this perspective, subject. And we uh, will be happy to take questions. Can we take questions for while you take a look, maybe we can get started in the in the room. Is there any question? Well, um, yeah, so the question was, how general is the statement that black holes return information? Um, I, I, would, I would maybe argue that we shouldn't quite ask that question. I think the question that we should ask is, in the real world, if you made a black hole and you isolated it well enough from the environment that it can evaporate peacefully and just go away, nothing else gets, you know, falls into the black hole, which is not what happens for astrophysical black holes, of course. But in that kind of setting, would you get the information back or not, right? That's what we really care about. And um, first of all, I don't want to appear as stating that this information is settled, you know, the way that it's, it's settled that planets go in elliptical orbits. <laughs> Uh, it's not settled experimentally, and that's the ultimate arbiter, right? Uh, what I can say is that the evidence for unitarity, the evidence that, that information comes out is, to me, overwhelming, the theoretical evidence for that at this point. Lots of things have happened that didn't have to happen that point in that direction. And those things don't depend very much on which particular model you're working in. So if you work in three-dimensional, three plus one-dimensional gravity, or if you want to work in some toy models, or if you want to work with string theory with a lot of extra dimensions, um, 
that doesn't make too much of a difference in this context. Yeah. Most of what you said has to do with uh, on fields, which are not the ground model, or the standard model fields. Yeah. And, and the question is, what's your view, or what's the status of quantization of gravitational radiation? And that um. Well, I yeah, that's a great question. I I think. Um, what, what what Jacob's work I, there's 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 so many things it taught us okay and one of them is that when people were thinking about quantizing gravity in the 50s 60s 70s and some people still think of it that way they were really thinking about it all backwards and all wrong so so for other classical fields you know there there was this sort of very successful history First, finding quantum electrodynamics, you know, taking Maxwell's theory and making it quantum. Then, you know, now it's, it's the, the field sort of breaks up into these photons, and you understand how it all becomes quantum mechanical. And then, you know, that was done for the strong and weak nuclear forces, and it was all unified in this very pretty picture. And, and so, certainly, the expectation was, I think, in a large part of the community, that that's what we have to do to gravity. We have to think of it as a field that needs to be quantized. Um, and you start, you know, with some sort of perturbative quantization, and then and then hope for the best. Um, and and I think that misses the point at several levels. Gravity is fantastically different from all the other forces, and 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 the fact that it already knows about the quantum states of these other forces uh, and its own is completely unique to it. And and uh, and so maybe in hindsight, it wasn't so surprising. That when people try to quantize the gravitational field sort of by brute force, they found that it didn't work. It was non-renormalizable. You know, it just blows up in your face. Uh, I think we now know why that why that's true. It's it's the wrong perspective on the problem. I'm not trying to say that semi-classical gravity is already all we need. Uh, but the fact that that the quantum states of matter are already baked into a lot of its state statements suggests that we shouldn't be trying to think of gravity in this particular way. Well, I don't doubt that there's going to be some effective description of gravitons. Uh, that, you know, the, the gravitational field, if, if, you, if you have gravitational waves with very little amplitude, you'll eventually be able to think of them as, as, as gravitons. Um, but it's, what I'm trying to say is that it's not going to be a useful approach, it seems, for finding a complete general theory of gravity to think of starting with these gravitons and somehow then making this more non-perturbative. Uh, the, the theory seems to reveal its interesting structure by thinking about non-perturbative objects from the start, like black holes. Oh, yeah. Okay, I didn't hear you. Should I ask my question now? Okay. Uh, so thanks for the wonderful talk. Uh, so you, you were discussing the, this unreasonable effectiveness of the gravitational path integral. So what, what in your view is the reason for is the underlying reason for this uh, uh, effectiveness beyond what but uh, it has the right to be effective for uh, uh, <laughs> is that, it is it just that's a, a great that's a great or? question that's the, that's mm -hmm. the question to which i would like to know the answer uh so so that's yes i i, I mean but that's why i'm excited i mean it, it, this has all been you know this work that i just described by Liesio and, and Turiachi, for example this is all from like less than two years ago uh this is there's a lot of things happening now, right, right now very rapidly. And, and a lot of it, you know, we, we really don't understand. It's, it's sort of how I imagine it must have been when, when, when Beckenstein first wrote down the, the GSL. And, you know, it's clearly, I mean, I don't want to compare quite the magnitude of the achievement, but, but, you know, in the beginning, you realize that something 
highly non-trivial is happening. A lot of things are fitting together that didn't have to work out. But at the same time, there's also lots of questions. Why is this happening? What exactly are the rules? I mean, that, that's, that's actually a pretty good parallel. Like, what exactly are the rules? That wasn't clear with the GSL from, from, you know, from day one. It was just clear that you know, it, was, it was highly non-trivial. It was obviously some deep truth in there. And, and, and then you know, there was a lot of stuff that needed to be sorted out over the, over the subsequent years. I think that the question that you're asking is one of those questions that's going to need to be sorted out. Um, this question of gravity ensemble duality that I mentioned on one of the slides. Um, you know, it, there's a, a lot of evidence for it, and yet we have no idea in most cases what that ensemble would even be. Um, so I would say it's an exciting time to be in the field. Uh, lots of interesting things are happening, and there are lots of confusions to be sorted out that, uh, uh, that you know, students and postdocs can use to leave a mark. Okay, so thank you all very much for joining us on this intermission for, from reality. And let's thank again our speaker, Rafael Busso.